Hey guys, I'm Papa Pete, and welcome to this month's episode of Any Homebrew News and Spotlight. Papa Pete, Papa Pete, the old ass gamer. Pete, Papa Pete, the old ass gamer. If you haven't grown up by the age of 50, you don't have to. Be sure to check out IntelliVisionCollector.com for all your Intellivision collecting needs. Whether it be ROMs for LTO Flash or Ultimate Flashback, the latest homebrew games available on the scene, or even games for the original 125, that's IntelliVisionCollector.com. Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2022 is now in the books, and it proved to be an absolutely huge event for the entire Intellivision homebrew community. There were over 30 members of the community present at the event, and there was an historic number of games released by several different publishers as well as programmers. Leading the way with the largest number of homebrew titles ever released at the same time, Intellivision Revolution debuted seven different games at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. From classic arcade shooters and maze games to remakes of classic adventure and platforming titles from the Atari 2600 library, Rev had a very diverse lineup that had collectors <laughs> digging deep into their wallets. The most prominent release of the event was undoubtedly the long-awaited Atari 2600 port, Pitfall 2. For the very first time, what many would consider to be one of the absolute best Atari titles from back in the day, Intellivision Revolution has now made Pitfall 2 available on the Intellivision. Also released were ports of two classic Howard Scott Warshaw titles, E.T. as well as Raiders of the Lost Ark. Both of these games were way ahead of their time when the original games released, uh, but the appreciation for them has significantly increased and grown steadily over the years. And now, they're available for the Intellivision with mostly original gameplay, but great graphical improvements. The fourth Intellivision Revolution release is a follow-up to Brian Puddin's Keystone Cops, and that is a port of the Atari 2600 Telsys classic, Fast Food. Releases 5 and 6 are two arcade classics. First, you have a remake of Missile Domination, which is called Missile Domination DX, or Deluxe. And the other one is a shooter that's long overdue for an Intellivision release, and that is Galaxian. The seventh and final Intellivision Revolution release is today's Spotlight Homebrew title, and that is Michael Hayes' A Better Mousetrap. You may remember my video playing this game way back in June. Well, now it's been picked up by Rev to be published in a beautiful Intellivision Revolution physical release. More on A Better Mousetrap in the Spotlight later on. Unfortunately, due to very limited production and great convention sales, all these titles are currently out of stock on the Intellivision Revolution store, but they're expected to be back in stock as early as December. And in a worst case scenario, at least we know that these titles will all be back in stock at least sometime in the future. Also in a very generous move, Rev recently released the Pitfall 2 ROM for the entire Intellivision homebrew community on Atari Age. And what he's asked is anybody can use it in emulation, but please give a voluntary do uh, donation if you enjoy the game and you're in a position to do so. And Television Collector made a huge announcement at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, debuting demos for its next two releases, IC005 Carlos Madruga's Operation Cloudfire and IC006 Beachhead. Following up on this very popular debut, both titles were released for sale on November 18th and are now available for purchase at www.intellivisioncollector.com. As a follow-up to the report in last month's episode of Any Homebrew News and Spotlight, the Television Collector has finalized the updated version of Vanguard that eliminates the gone bug that was seen when the game was played on original hardware. As a means of ensuring that every customer who wishes to replace original bug game with an updated one at no cost to themselves, Intellivision Collector now has replacement kits currently available that can be purchased and then fully refunded upon return of the original bug, uh, board, or cartridge. The refund will even include the cost of shipping the board back to a television collector, as long as you also include uh, your receipt in the package. 
If a customer wishes to keep both copies of the game, they only pay the nominal fee for the cost of the replacement items. For further details, including the different types of exchanges possible, such as board, full cartridge, or even complete in-box exchanges, check out IntelligentCollector.com or refer to the email that was sent to all Vanguard purchasers. Intellivision Collector wants to ensure all their customers that the customer satisfaction is their number one priority and to not hesitate to contact them through the website if they have any questions or concerns. Some minor progress was made for the planning of the 2022 Intellivision Homebrew Awards and Hall of Fame ceremonies at PRGE because all five members of the committee attended and they had the opportunity to discuss plans for the upcoming event. Although they haven't yet made a final decision on the number of nominees in each category or even the, uh, what the exactly the categories will be at this point, they will be deciding in the very near future. I hope to be able to announce these details in a future episode of Any Homebrew News of Spotlight well before the actual nominees and Hall of Fame announcements are made early in the new year. Briefly in Intellivision news, the next game awaiting final production and distribution by Intellivision Revolution is Tron Anthology. Originally planned for a potential December release, the exact release date is not yet known at this time. I have confirmed with David Harley, however, that the four Intelligent Vision adaptations of the classic Tron titles will be available on one menu-driven cartridge. I'm sure that all homebrew collectors are looking forward to getting this title very much. In Electronite news, William Muller pre-sold 50 copies of both Cat Attack and Star Mercenary at PRGE, and these have since been produced and distributed. 50 additional copies of Star Mercenary, as well as 30 copies of the Pandora Incident, also went on sale during PRGE from Steve Roney on the Blue Sky Rangers eBay store. Both of these titles sold out in an extremely short time. Once again, although all of these games were in very short supply, Electronite hopes to have more in stock in the future. Jay Howlett's Blah Blah Woof Woof had PRG full physical releases for two games he'd previously announced on Atari Age. The first game is the puzzle game Fox's Quest, and the second is the TI-99 hit Parsec. Here you can see some footage of Jay demonstrating Fox's Quest. It's got one wire that's so loose it pulls like four inches out of the back of the thing. I'm like, you need to pop the bottom of that, that's how it looks. Yeah. 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 Take it home with you, put it on the pile. Right, yeah, but you don't, yeah, I guess what you don't know what goes on. Next, let's take a look at this video courtesy of Steve Jones as Jay demonstrates Parsec and also drops the news on his next three releases. This is Parsec. This is one of two new games by Baba Woof Woof, aka Jay Howlett. Here is Jay here, Mr. BBWW himself. Getting creamed. I'm dying like, here. Like me, Jay had a TI-99 when he was younger and they had some great games on there. There's a couple more TI-99 ports coming out next month. Next month. Next month. And then another game. When's the fifth game coming out? This year? January. January. That'll be Load Runner. Load Runner is coming out and there will actually be like a level editor like there was in the old versions. So Jay, after PRG, where will these be available for sale? Um, Atari Age, Facebook, All the usual uh, places. anywhere that's hard to find. Okay, perfect. So once again, this is Parsec. It's a space shoot 'em up. This was the probably the most popular game on TI-99 back in the day. So huge news that Blah Blah Wolf Wolf is releasing three more games in the very near future. Two of them, even as soon as December, and the next one at least in just fairly early in the new year. Unfortunately, a gameplay bug has been found in the PRG release copies of Parsec, and all follow-up sales have been paused until the ROM can be fixed. Thankfully, Jay Hallett has announced on Atari Age that the problem causing the bug has been identified, and steps will soon be taken to fix the ROM. They'll also have to deal with the issue of the original games that were sold at PRGE containing this bug. I'll update this story as the events unfold in a future episode of Any Homebrew News and Spotlight. In other news outside of PRGE, Inti Home recently announced on Facebook that programmer Dino Yachaya is currently working on an Intellivision homebrew port of a beloved Parker Brothers Atari 2600 release that just didn't make its way to the Intellivision back in the day. 
The Italian-based publisher of titles Gyrus, Ghostbusters, and Quo Vadis has announced that Spider-Man will be coming to the Intellivision with a full physical release as early as December 2022. Dino has released some very early title graphics, music, and gameplay that you can see here. To follow this title's production and release, see the Grupo Vintage Console Group on Facebook. And some late breaking news in Television Brazil has announced on their Facebook group that the first game from programmer Sergio Veras, Rally X, is almost ready for release. During the game's production, Veras received some help and advice from experienced programmers Arturo Ragazzini and Carlos Madruga. Madruga had very positive things to say about Rally X, as well as the hard work that Veras put in while creating the game. Madruga also said that he's very optimistic that Veras will be making more great games in the future. Be sure to follow the Intellivision Brazil Facebook group for details on an upcoming digital release, or perhaps even a physical release later on down the road. Once again, to recap the top story from this month's episode, after a two-year hiatus, the Portland Retro Gaming Expo is in the books, and it was a record year for Intellivision homebrew releases. Intellivision Collector, Electronite, Blah Blah Woof Woof, all had major releases and announcements. And Intellivision Revolution released seven, yeah, count of seven titles, the most new games ever released at one time by any publisher of Intellivision homebrew games. As I've said many times before, it's a fantastic time to be an Intellivision homebrew collector. And now it's time to take a look at this month's Spotlight game, A Better Mousetrap by Michael Hayes, recently released by Intellivision Revolution. Let's take a look. Back in June, I did an episode of Old Guys and Old Games featuring Coleco's and television title, Mousetrap. It was part of uh, Astro Smash Monday's High Score Challenge. And afterwards, Michael Hayes, and I don't mean the wrestler, I mean the programmer of such titles as Blix and the Chocolate Mine, Fubar, and X-Ray and Diligus. As well as a host of the website Midnight Blue International, he contacted me and he gave me a copy of his hacked version of the game, A Better Mousetrap. As is the case with most hacked games, Michael's goal was to take out the bad stuff that was in there, make the good stuff even better, and create a more fun version of the game overall. So let's take a look at some of the things that Michael changed, some of the things that he left alone, and whether or not he was successful at improving this game overall. The original Mousetrap was an arcade maze game on the heels of Pac-Man and the Pac-Man craze, uh, where the player was a mouse, traveled through a maze eating cheese and prizes, ultimately trying to clear out each maze and score as many points as possible, as were most games at that time all about points. The main enemies were cats in this game, and they wandered around the maze trying to hunt the mice. And the power-up? Well, the power-up were actually dog bones, which unlike Pac-Man, you could store them up as you needed. It did not automatically take effect. And you could change yourself into a dog, turn the tables on the cats, and take them out instead. Another addition to the maze were three different colored doors that could be switched by hitting a corresponding button on the keypad. And this let you change the maze in different ways and develop a strategy for either avoiding the cats when you were a mouse or attacking them when you were a dog. The center of the maze also has a teleporter which would randomly send players to one of the symbols in the outer corner of the maze. Finally, in harder levels, there's a hawk that flies around the maze, totally ignoring the pathways that can kill the player as either a mouse or the dog. And these hawks certainly add a real challenging aspect to the gameplay. The gameplay in Mousetrap lends itself very well to the Intellivision controller and its keypad. Naturally, you move yourself around the maze with the disc, but the player also has four very distinct actions that are assigned to the keypad. The first three are the three different colored doors, which have buttons one through three with the corresponding color. And these allow you to switch those doors simply by pressing the button. The fourth action is eating a bone and briefly turning into a dog so you can turn the table and then eat the cats. And this is assigned to button 5 of the keypad. There were no real improvements to be made with this control scheme, so a better mousetrap kept the same controls as the original version, and uh, I feel there might have been some minor tweaks in the player's ability to line up with the different pathways, but uh, overall the gameplay remains pretty much the same. I feel that there may have been some minor tweaks in the player's movement, 
but perhaps making it a little bit easier to line up to the entrances as you navigate the ma uh, maze. But really with practice, I found that both versions controlled reasonably well. Now we'll talk about the graphics, and we're really getting into the areas of the game that had the majority of the changes that Michael made. Michael made several graphical changes in A Better Mousetrap, all which provide minor improvements. First of all, Michael added title screens to the very beginning of the game, uh, with very general title and also credit screens, but there are also two screens with very basic instructions, which are kind of interesting, as you enter the number of players, as well as the difficulty level before you start playing. When you do first start playing, some of the first things you might notice are color changes. First, the cheese bits and the maze walls are now green instead of yellow, like the arcade. The white doors, uh, controlled by button 2 and the keypad, are now yellow, which is also like the original arcade version. I find these easier to see while I'm playing, so I really do like that change. Finally, as uh, for another color change, probably the last color change, the cats are now orange instead of being a, this bland beige color from the Coleco version. Uh, two of the three remaining graphical changes are very subtle, with uh, the inbox in the middle where you go into the teleporter being somewhat more uh, clearly defined, and also the text used in the game is now mixed case. It's not just all capital letters. Now the final change, the one change that I haven't mentioned yet, is very easy to see, and that's that the cheese pieces that you're gobbling up are now six pixels instead of three, so they're much larger. It makes it a lot easier to find the few pieces when you miss them as you're trying to clean everything up in the maze. Um, overall, these graphical changes aren't revolutionary to the game, but each and every one makes a, a, the overall experience a little bit better, and when you put them all together, the sum is a pretty uh, significant improvement. And now here's the real meat and potatoes of the changes that Michael made in A Better Mousetrap, his adjustments to the sound and the music. First of all, Michael added a few of the original sound bites from the arcade system back into the action since they were missing from the Clica version. Uh, or at least they were very simplified in the Clica version. The original arcade end-of-level fanfare sound was added back into the game to uh, accompany that explosive transition, which I suppose is more graphical, but the two just sort of go hand-in-hand hand and go together. Uh, and that happens just before the text goes up on the screen that says, Bonus score for cheeses, 10,000 points. The original arcade death tune was also added back into the game, accompanying uh, flashing green and purple mazes. Uh, that ha That's what happens when you do uh, get caught, uh, when the mouse or dog gets caught by the cat or hawk. Michael also added in four different arcade fanfares that occur when you pick up one of the prizes. I always liked these original sounds for Mousetrap, and I was really sad to see that they weren't in the Coleco version. But I've saved the absolute biggest and best change that Michael made for last. He removed, completely removed, stripped right out that utterly annoying in-game music uh, from the game altogether. The non-stop music in the Coleco version of the game is so repetitive, so annoying, that frankly it ruins the experience of what is an otherwise a very fine game. While Michael stripped that music out, it could riddance. No other changes have been made to this game other than this specific one. It still would have been a vast improvement. When you add this huge improvement to the, all the other ones made to the sounds, I definitely have to say that the sounds and music in A Better Mousetrap are significantly better than the original Coleco release and frankly are very good overall. When I debuted A Better Mousetrap on my channel way back in June, there were lots of discussion in the comments and chat of whether or not Michael's approved version of the game was worthy of a full physical release. Shortly thereafter, Michael and Rev got together and I'm happy to see this full physical release of A Better Mousetrap and that it was one of the seven new releases from Rev at PRGE October 2022. It's out of stock right now, but keep your eye on the Intellivision Revolution store. It's going to be back in stock in the future. So, as I alluded to earlier, I've always enjoyed playing Mousetrap, and frankly, uh, I like it better than a lot of other maze games, including Pac-Man. I enjoy playing the original Coleco version too, and I was excited to see what improvements Michael made in his version, how he made it a better Mousetrap. 
You know, I'd like to point out that the gameplay, the control in a better mousetrap to the original is more or less the same. There weren't many changes made, and that's not a bad thing. Mousetrap's weaknesses weren't in its gameplay. It was in its minor graphical shortcomings as well as its major sound and music problems. Michael did a very good job at improving these weaknesses, reinserting many sounds and graphical transitions from the original arcade title, and most importantly, getting rid of that horrendous background music. Has Michael succeeded in making a better mousetrap? I'd say most definitely he has. And based upon the existing gameplay, along with the improved graphics, sound, music, I'm going to give Michael Hayes' A Better Mousetrap a 7.5 out of 10 rating. Well, guys, that's it for this month's episode of Any Homebrew News and Spotlight. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with Coco and I here today, and I hope I will see you again next month when I bring you some more in television homebrew news, as well as a spotlight on a title from the Intellivision Homebrew Library. Take care. Papa Pete, Papa Pete, the old ass gamer. Hey, it's Paul Nermanen, or Nermix, from the Intellivisionaries Podcast, and you're watching Papa Pete, the old guy gamer.